Gentlemen, gentlemen, gentlemen. Rohan, Kevin, Yarushkili. You guys are uh, just a slice of the promiscuous carnival of souls that are hanging out here at Burning Man. I'd like to engage you with the following inquiry, okay? What is the meaning of life? What are we meant to do with ourselves? What is our noble aim? What is our holy purpose? The end scene of the film Flight from Death, The Quest for Immortality, has a line by Jean-Paul Sartre that says, everything has been figured out except how to live. And then he goes on to say, so perhaps the better question is not what are we to do with death, but what are we to do with life? Life exists in individual moments and it is up to us to make sure that those moments are vital, interconnected and grand, to make a masterpiece out of life, one that we would willingly live again and again for all of eternity. This is what we can strive for. You hear a line like that and it's really poetic because it's basically saying that we don't control what brought us into being. We don't control the circumstances, the miracles within miracles, within miracles, within miracles that led to the DNA in your father's sperm landing at the egg of your mom and the conception and et cetera, et cetera. And so the film is ultimately saying there's so much that we don't control except so, so, so there's so much we don't control. So what do we do? And it ends with this notion that that becomes the challenge. Everything has been figured out, the laws of physics, so on and so forth except this thing of like what to do with ourselves, you know? The existential conundrum is what the fuck do we do? Um, and of course, in the face of finitude and mortality, it's like, yeah, you know, we worry about this thing called death and they're ultimately saying, well, don't worry about death and instead focus on individual moments, you know, and make those moments vital, interconnected, grand, holy, make a masterpiece out of your life willingly that you would willingly live again and again for all of eternity. And, and finally, he, he says, um, you don't conquer the anxiety about dying, you meet it with courage, which is a beautiful ending, again, in the face of our cosmic hopelessness. But I, I'm less interested in the cosmic hopelessness and more interested in moments of such sublime beauty, rapture, and rhapsody that they push death out of our minds long enough for us to forget that it exists. And for that moment, we experience infinitude. We become as gods. We remember who we are. We remember what we forgot. We are an animating force in the universe. We too, we do take matter of low organization, right? We put it through our mental filters and we extrude technological superstructures, right? We're the coral reef-like animal, the extruder of technological material that turns, that, that, that farts, that vomits iPhones, computers, the internet, and space shuttles into existence. And the ironic thing is, if you zoom out far enough, right, it does look like we instantiate our imagination. David Deutsch said in the beginning of infinity that if you look at the topography of a modern city, that's a physical topography where the forces of mind, intentionality, economics, again, consciousness itself has trumped geology. But why does it take time-lapse photography? Why does it take us zooming out? Why does it take a shift in scale and in time in order for us to appreciate what we are? Right? This extropic evolutionary force, this sentient emergence, this technium, so to speak, this superorganism that in a way is the most heroic thing in the cosmos because we are a runaway train against entropy. Right? We are on a holy pathway towards the omega point. Right? Supersymmetry, hyperintelligence, right? the, whatever McKenna calls it, the transcendental object at the end of time beckoning us towards transcension so that we can realize that we are infinite. And so what do we do to remind ourselves of this? What do we do to purge ourselves of our amnesia? How do we trigger, how do we occasion what Jamie Wheel calls amnesis, the forgetting of the forgetting? How do we remember who we are? I think cinema does it well. I think editing does it well. I think steering attention towards the big picture does it well. I think opiated adjacency does it well. I think occasional experiences of awe, rapture, and beauty. Experiences that stretch your mental models of the world. Once a mind is stretched by a new idea, it will never return to its original position. What is awe? What do positive psychologists tell us about experiences of opiated adjacency, awe, and wonder? They tell us that they are cognitive, cognitively beneficial. How so? How is getting gobsmacked by beauty? How is being delighted and and surprised and hurled into an ecstatic no man's land of cognitive thrills good for us. Well, it stretches our mental models of reality. What is awe? 
awe is an experience of such perceptual vastness that your mental models of reality that you rely upon, right? The map instead of the territory that you rely upon to orient yourself in the world. The set of algorithms that allow you to function adequately in the world and not be perpetually astonished, right? The filters through which you make sense of the matrix. Those things are called not just into question, but they are invited to enlarge themselves. Your models of the world have to now accommodate themselves to this new transcendental object at the end of time. And when you come to a place like this, it's basically a theater of the absurd that invites you into that contemplation with the transcendental object at the end of time. This place is an unconstructed dream space. This place is a supermarket of memes. This place is a juxtaposition of pocket universes. This place is a demolition derby of reality constructs colliding on a parched void, the effect of which is the collision between mind and such enrapturing novelty that you get hurled into ecstatic mind spaces that are so novel and so new that it heals you of your fractures. Somehow right. it does that. The dance with the ecstatic cleanses us of our suffering. It's an absolution. Last night I had a church-like experience and I don't even go to church, you know? <laughs> The secular Jew called me had an ecstatic encounter with a shamanic mobile church called Mayan Warrior. And this mobile <laughs> church art car started moving through the playa in pursuit of whatever art piece they were going to park themselves on and set up, set up the show for the night. And the, the bicyclists following the art car in pilgrimage through the parched void was the most magnificent display of the, I, the word church italicized back to its real meaning, you know, right. that I've ever witnessed. Like it brings me almost to tears to, 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 to try to fit it in my head, a fucking act of reverence. So that's been Burning Man so far. What do you think, Kevin? You said it. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> No, following, following a type of leadership. Can you imagine back in the days, the military following the general, thousands of soldiers following this. The, the, the feeling of meaning inside. that people used to the get when they go inside. to battle. Yeah. When you're so caught up in the meaning yeah. of something larger than yourself and yeah. you forget yourself and you lose your ego yeah, and you yeah. have what they call ecstatic communitas. Exactly. They wrote about it in Stealing Fire. And the moment of ecstatic communitas is where you're connecting with something larger than ourselves. It's the reason why... I mean, I know we don't like war here, but it's the reason that yeah. somebody would willingly serve exactly. in a war and be willing to die for an idea that they believe in. Steve the idea Knox. can be corrupted, no doubt, but it's what makes us submit to something larger than ourselves that heals us of the diseases of self-obsession yeah. and the ego. You, you nailed it. It comes from the inside. It, comes it has from to, come, to come from the inside. How did you summon up the courage to serve in battle? It's, it's not courage. You're, you're, born, you're born with it. Just you, you either have trigger. it or you don't? Yeah, you have to trigger that opens it and this is how it goes out. Some people like are just you have, born. You, like you have it with this. Some people are just, they're more susceptible to shamanic trance. Right, exactly. They're, they're, they can easy, they're, it's easier for them to submit because they don't have such strong egos. Exactly. Yeah. For it's instance, or, yesterday or we, were, we were right. there where they did the, the, the meditation. We couldn't submit to that like they submitted. Okay, so you have your own set of triggers is yeah, what you're yeah. saying. Right, exactly. Yeah, Everybody yeah, yeah. has their own yeah. set of triggers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Access, exactly. mm, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's been an eight-minute tirade. We have an audience of <laughs> promiscuous souls surfing the playa. What's up, guys? What's up? Thank you for joining what our hang. Speaker. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You're very sweet. Steve I feel down. better after I speak what I feel. If I hold it in, it makes me kind of antsy. Yeah, no. You should. I have to purge. That's absolutely important. We should, we should get Jason on TV. I was just yeah, kidding. Yeah, yeah. Come here, Rohan. Come here, Rohan. Maybe he wants to with that. Rohan, Rohan. I want you to tell me about a transitory enchanted moment in which you held your breath and you were compelled into an aesthetic contemplation you neither understood nor desired, face to face, perhaps for the last time in history, <laughs> with something can measure it to your capacity for wonder. <laughs> if there's one place you can give an answer to that question, that's Burning Man. <laughs> but it's hard to pick just any one moment because there's so many. But I would like to add to what you said earlier that Please. the magic of Burning Man exists primarily because it's temporary. 
It's mm. ephemeral. It's mm. uh, uh, it's impermanent. Mm. And at the end of these seven days, this whole city disappears. All the art is burnt, and it's gone. That's very so interesting the, because you think that the minute something stops being impermanent, we start taking it for granted. Exactly. Things are only holy when they're outside of time and in stasis. Yeah. And so ephemerality, by definition, is a subjectivity that exists outside of time. If you can enjoy ephemerality without being haunted and depressed, you're actually in the moment. It's when you start thinking, oh shit, this moment's gonna end, that you're not really in the moment anymore. Absolutely. You're anticipating misery, which I'm pretty good at. Yep, totally. <laughs> I'm trying to heal myself of that. But. <laughs> but it's interesting, this place has been very much a place that finally um, does justice to a lot of quotes that have been like post-it notes that I've been collecting Signed. for what I think transcendence should be like. You know, like I'm like a religious pilgrim with no religion, right? What does they call it? As spirituality wanes, experience is the new faith and we are refugees from the mundane, right? We are refugees from the mundane. And so, okay, that makes sense. This was from an article called <laughs> the, the Death of Awe in the Age of Awesome. And, and, and he starts with an F. Scott Fitzgerald line. And it's talking about Dutch sailors. So imagine like, you know, after Christopher Columbus or whatever, Europeans going to what they perceived as the new world for the first time, right? From their POV, it's an intergalactic journey, right? They're sailing out into the void and they're landing in a world in which they have no reference points. So F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote about specifically the Dutch sailors. And he talks about them witnessing the fresh green breast of a new world, okay? And then he says, man must have held his breath right in the presence of this new continent right compelled into an aesthetic contemplation okay compelled by you don't have a choice compelled into an aesthetic contemplation he neither understood nor desired and then he says face to face for the perhaps for the last time in history with something can measure it to his capacity for wonder wow. because think about it once we map the planet been there, done that. The map becomes the territory, and then no, nothing ever fits our, nothing is ever commensurate to our capacity for wonder. So I read that quote, and it made me mad, because I'm like, I want that fucking feeling. I want the feeling of those European sailors seeing the new world for the first time. I'm not endorsing what they did with the natives afterwards. I'm just talking about that first feeling of that virginal noticing, that sense of first sight unencumbered by knowingness. I would read that quote, and I was like, but he said for the last time in history. So unless we go to outer space, we don't get to experience that. Burning Man, by being such a brilliant assemblage of reality constructs, you know, Eric Davis's demolition derby of reality constructs colliding in a parched void, forces you, gobsmacks you, into, I think, experiencing something finally commensurate to your capacity for wonder. And as Carl Sagan, the eminent wonder junkie astronomer used to say, I mean, it is in the act of wonder that we get off with God, right? And that's fucking awesome, right? You know, like, yeah. I was gonna say something really vulgar and spiritual, but I, I thought I, maybe I'll hold it. You guys can guess, maybe. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys for hanging. Woo! Woo! Look at that beautiful crowd of souls and that statue behind them. Other people over there. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> we'll come back later. Good afternoon, good evening, and good night.